season one of Written in Stone, the 1990s is supported by Tension Climbing, wooden training tools designed with purpose in Denver, Colorado. Use the code STONE, that's S-T-O-N-E, to get 10% off of your next purchase at tensionclimbing.com and to let them know that their support for this show matters. Not valid for tension board sets, hardware, or gift cards. It cannot be combined with other offers. Tensionclimbing.com. Mastery over success. Antagonistic root names aren't new. And I'm not talking about the childish names like those that litter Waco tanks and many other areas. And I use the word litter there with great purpose. No, I'm talking the clever, witty, not vindictive or meant to be hurtful, but with just enough venom that the person the name is aimed at has to shake their head and smile, despite the obvious wound. Something like full service in Waco Tanks comes to mind, actually. John Sherman had done the stand, but not the full line, and was hiding it so that it wouldn't get snaked. But that backfired, and when Dale Goddard found it, he did it. And rather than Sherman's working name, full service, he called it Serves You Right, a razor-sharp play on words. Lucky for Sherman, he wrote the guidebook. So we used his name and got the last word. And I mean, I came up in hip hop where battling has been a tradition for as long as hip hop's been around. And as an MC, a war of words is special to me. The more clever, the more callous, the deeper the cut, the better. But then you shake hands and you keep it moving. Because this is a sport. An all-out battle that while, yes, a lifestyle sport is one you're ready to give your life for, it means that much, especially when you're 20-something years old, full of vim and vigor and rage and self-righteousness and at the very top of the game. So it's no surprise that when Jibé Tribu rubbed Ben Moon the wrong way and Ben Moon grated on Tribu's nerves, the two young men had words the way they understood best. With root names. I'm Chris Hampton. You're listening to a bonus episode of Written in Stone, Climbing's Most Important Ascents. This is Season 1, the 1990s. One, two, At the Strait of Dover, the UK and France are less than 21 miles apart. But this proximity doesn't represent the climbing scene of the early 1990s, because if we go epicenter to epicenter, from the knacky edges and undercuts at Raventor to the pocketed walls of Bukes, we're going closer to 900 miles. And this chasm comes a little closer to reality. Of course, It wasn't always this way. In the 1970s, French climber Jean-Claude Droyer was invited to Wales by the English Climbing Federation. And it's on this trip that he realizes the potential of free climbing. What the English were doing was remarkable. And he brings those ideas back to his local crag, Les Sassois, and decides to push the idea of removing points of aid and instead free climbing. And in 1979, he cleans up an old line out of steep bulge with an intricate sequence and begins working it, falling, hanging on the rope, trying again. Unheard of. His friend, Jean-Pierre Bouvier, joins him and eventually, in 1981, cracks the code. Chimpanzadrome, the first 7C+, or 13A, in France. The two legends don't know it yet, but their new route will, three years later, be ground zero for a battle against the British that will stretch more than a decade. 
And at the same time as Bouvier was clipping the chains of Chimpanzodrome, over in the UK, an 18-year-old kid who had loads of confidence about his abilities was starting to make waves in an otherwise understated climbing scene. He would soon travel to America and repeat their hardest routes, including the first ever flash of a 12C. And it was this style, doing things first try, where he would really shine. For the next couple of years, he established himself as a strong contender for the best climber on the planet, on sighting 12D and establishing the first 13C in the world in Germany's Frankenjura. No place was safe from Jerry Moffat. And then, in the spring of 1984, Jerry traveled to France to see what he could pick off there. And he brought with him his young protege, Ben Moon. And after doing the quick second ascent of Marc Le Ministrel's Le Bidule, the hardest route in the country at 8A+, or 13C, and wobbling Ben on Chimpanzodrome, which Ben worked out over a few days to tick as his first of the grade, Jerry hatched a plan. He'd attempt to flash the route for his 21st birthday. A route of this grade hadn't been flashed before, but Jerry was confident. In his book, Revelations, written with Niall Grimes, he says, Sunday climbers had arrived from Paris, and the normally deserted crag looked like a different place. The French were immaculate, with beautiful matching tops and bottoms, hair coiffured, perfect suntans and toweling headbands, their carabiners all matched. They were also clean. We mingled with the Parisians like two dogs. Ben, with his pasty white skin, looked about 15. His long black hair was starting to mat into dreadlocks. His clothes were filthy. I too had scruffy clothes, holes in my trousers. My hair dyed into black and red patches, punk style. We looked more like refugees than climbers. We went over to our cave and got our gear on, and I warmed up by doing a 7B overhang, first go, which attracted some attention from the French. They watched us go over to Chimpanzodrome. At the time, I always climbed in my lucky swami belt, a simple ribbon of webbing with no leg loops to keep myself light. I tied on to a single rope, nine millimeters in diameter, and fired the pitch off, first try. I ripped it to bits. Straight after, Ben too went up at once more like a rat up a drain pipe. The French were stunned. We wandered to the sleeping cave, and as we'd done everything that we wanted to do, packed our bags. We might as well head south. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. And well, the French took it personal. Sure, they were inspired by the feat, but just a few years ago, it was the hardest route in their country, a symbol of their evolving ethics and a touchstone for their culture. And this filthy punk rock kid was just going to walk up at first try? It was like a knife to the heart. To make matters worse, the pair did go south to the Verdon, where Jerry would complete the world's first 13A onsite, and in two attempts would dispatch an open project bolted by French superstar Patrick Edlanger. Jerry was twisting the knife. Back in the UK after the whirlwind French takeover, Moffat set his sights on ethering his own home turf. At Raventor, he figured out the direct start to Ron Fawcett's The Prow to create the first 8A plus in the UK, Revelations. And the name was obvious. It was a revelation for UK climbers. He was a revelation. His climbing was a revelation. But there was one gigantic revelation to come that Jerry never expected. In August of 1985, two of France's brightest climbers, J.B. Tribou and Antoine Le Ministrel, traveled to Sheffield. They wanted to try the hard routes that had been going up there, and while they were welcomed and the visit was friendly, there is no doubt that scars from Moffat's decisive attack still lingered. With them, they carried new ethics, those developed at Sassois. For the most part, the English climbers were still using the yo-yo tactic. They would climb up, and upon falling, immediately lower back to the ground, no working the moves. 
However, the rope could remain through the highest piece of gear, so eventually they would be top roping through the hardest parts before sending, and that's in air quotes, a route. But the French had realized this method was time-consuming and, frankly, silly, and had taken to hanging on the rope and figuring out the moves. This made things faster, more interesting, and far less frustrating. The weather around Sheffield, as it tended to be, was terrible. The only dry rock they could find was at Raventor, an area they were just not impressed by. But Antoine quickly noticed Moffat's revelations. The best-looking route at the wall, and the hardest. Win, win. After a quick working go, he was ready to send. And while Antoine would never say it himself, being a quiet, thoughtful, and creative soul, he just straight up obliterated it. Second try, the hardest route in the country. And then Antoine had a revelation of his own. He would free solo it. Over the next several days, he climbs the route seven more times while Trabu works to figure out the bottom boulder. And then, on a perfect weather day, in the early evening as the crag empties of climbers, he senses that it's time. He writes in his diary, I'm at the foot of the route. My head is empty, my body filled with concentration. The moves are linked in perfection. No hesitation, no unnecessary movement, no tension. Just total concentration, all the way to the top. I climbed into a state of grace, as I had never before climbed. Moffat, out with elbow problems, could do nothing to respond. He just had to take it. I admit it was a good effort, outrageous even, and there was nothing I could take away from him for doing it. But there was absolutely nothing I could do as a response to it. I couldn't go and add something harder. I couldn't go and solo something. I couldn't go back to France and do one of his hard routes. I was gutted. 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 We'll be right back. What's up, everybody? I just wanted to drop in here to say thank you. Projects like this take way too many hours to make, and it just doesn't happen without your support. So whether it's training plans, courses, or products, it's your support of Power Company Climbing, as well as our sponsors here on this show, that has given me the time and motivation to conceptualize and create things like this podcast. So as a thank you, we're offering 20% off of almost everything on our site. Finger files, clippers, apparel, proven plans, ebooks, courses, and more. For details, go to powercompanyclimbing.com slash stone. And then use the code stone, that's S-T-O-N-E, at checkout. Powercompanyclimbing.com. Learn. Grow. Excel. Spring, 1988. The solo of Revelations has fundamentally changed British climbing. Everyone is hangdogging, and suddenly, they can all do Revelations. Standards were rising, and most on fire was Ben Moon. He'd been going every year to Bukes, the place to be in the late 80s. French superstars like Ed Langer, Trebou, the Les Ministrelles brothers, Catherine Destevelle, and Didier Rabatou, as well as visiting legends like Lynn Hill, Wolfgang Gulich, and Stefan Glovach. They were all there. Ben worked his way through the grades. Rev de Papillon, Chouca, and La Rose and Le Vampire. The French noticed. Just six weeks after getting a cast off of a broken hand, Ben had a big ten days in Bukes. On Monday, he did Le Spectre. On Friday, he did Le Minimum. And on the following Wednesday, La Rage de Vive. All 8B+, or 14A. They were the hardest routes in Bukes, and the only other person to tick all three was Jerry Moffat. Ben had done them in a row. In 10 days, the first ascensionists of the routes, in order, J.B. Trebu, Marc Le Ministrel, and Antoine Le Ministrel, couldn't ignore the reality. 
the best climbers in Bukes weren't French. They were British. And then, in the fall of 88, Ben turned his sights toward an open project that Mark LeMinistrel had tried briefly, but had abandoned. 17 days of work spread out across two months, and he had sorted out an unlikely sequence, but was getting more and more fatigued and frustrated that he wasn't closing the deal. He fell at the last move, which meant he could do it. But when he started falling on the warm-ups, he headed home for the holidays to recharge his batteries. Returning in January of 89 with renewed psych and a little bouldering under his belt, he dispatched the route quickly in just a couple of tries. The new route at 8C was not only the hardest route in Bukes, but the hardest route in all of France. And at the urging of Sean Miles, Ben gave it the name Agincourt, in reference to a battle of the Hundred Years' War in which the English were victorious over France on French soil. The French had shown Ben how to better work roots, and in turn, he'd beaten them at their own game, at their best crag. And before that wound could heal, Ben would strike again. At Volks, a training cave for the French climbers, Ben snatched a project from the locals who had gotten close to doing it and graded it 8C as well, making it the second in the country. And even though the route was already being called Les Plafonds, meaning the roof, Ben would give it the name Maginot Line, another French military disaster in which the French assumed their fortifications were impervious to attack and decided to just rest on their laurels. But they were wrong and Germany invaded anyway. The French climbers had assumed this route was theirs, so much so that they'd already installed a small plaque at the base with the name Les Plafonds inscribed on it. But when Ben finished the route, Patrick Edlanger, who would repeat the route soon after, removed the plaque and ceremoniously handed it to him. An admission of defeat, a surrender. And much like Jerry had done, Ben returned home, energized from the victory, and pushed things one step further, launching climbing into the stratosphere, the world's first 8C+, Hubble. And Ben was twisting the knife. Trabu felt it the most. He was reeling a little from not having finished his project in the U.S. and was questioning his own climbing when the knife penetrated. So he formulated a plan of revenge. He'd quickly repeat Moon's Maginot line, the third ascent after Ed Langer. And with part one of the plan in place, he'd return to the U.S. to finish up his project at Smith Rock, Just Do It. He'd give that the grade of AC+, the second in the world behind Ben Moon's Hubble. And then two years later, he'd return to Volks to extend Maginot line, linking it to the ending of the nearby route Terminator to create a new super route. He'd call it La Lune de la Canavo, which translates to the moon in the gutter. Trabu would originally grade the route 9A, on par with the hardest in the world, but would quickly roll that back to 8C+. And the route would be immortalized in Masters of Stone 3, though, sadly, by then Trabu had also reverted the name back to Le Super Plafond, Super Roof. Ben, who claims the root names were never meant as a declaration of war, says of Trabu's original name, he should have stuck with it. It was a good response. But maybe this name change was the biggest diss of all, ignoring that Ben Moon had put his own mark on the root and instead playing off of the original working name. But Ben wouldn't let well enough alone. At the time, despite the work ethic and effort levels of the French superstar, he just didn't believe Trabu was strong enough to claim 8C+. Following a disastrous trip to India that left Ben woefully out of shape, he returned to France to check out the super roof, as well as another 8C+, that had gone up at Orgon at the hands of Francois Petit, called Bronx. Trabu had also repeated this route, and at first, Ben was struggling. 
But as we all know, fitness comes back fairly quickly when you have a high base level of strength. And so suddenly, Ben was back to peak form and repeated Bronx without much of a fight. Two days later, he worked out the moves of Super Plafon and sent easily on his next try, even skipping a rest because he just didn't need it. Later that year, 1995, Ben would publish an article in On The Edge magazine, calling out all of the top climbers of the time for overgrading. Trabu didn't escape the vitriol. Certainly I can think of two AC routes in England that are as difficult as Bronx and Super Plafond, which are graded AC+. Super Plafond, originally graded at 9A, has now had five ascents and is a good example of how far out a top climber can get a grade when he's climbing at his limit, he writes. And the subtext here is worth looking at. You were climbing at your limit. It took me two tries. Yeah, the knife was still there and it was being twisted. But the subtext wasn't the worst of it. Ben would also take aim at Trabu's most famous first ascent. Moving on to just do it, Smith Rock, USA, another AC plus route, there must be a big question mark over whether this deserves the grade. Climbed way back in 92 by Jibé Trabu, can this really be the same grade as Action Direct? For that matter, can it be the same grade as Bronx? on the French side, Trabu wasn't just sitting there taking it. In his own articles in the French magazine Grimper, he writes, It isn't only in England where people climb hard. To say that a route repeated several times like Super Plafond or Bronx is clearly easier than Hubble, repeated twice by climbers who've done nothing else, is absurd. For these routes have been tried more. They're in the south of France. Which top climbers have tried Hubble in good conditions? None. Move Hubble to Oregon, and it would have seven or eight ascents. I can't say how Jibé Trabu feels about all of this. But in interviews, Ben Moon has said that he feels a little guilty for how it all went down. Personally, I love it. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, the more clever, the more callous, the deeper the cut, the better. But then you shake hands and keep it moving. And while I doubt that Ben and Jibé are the best of friends chatting weekly on the phone about old times, they both seem to have let it go. In fact, there are several photos from the 2014 Kalimnos Climbing Festival where the two seem to be tolerating, maybe even enjoying each other's company. And why not? Both are still at it. Trabu is now 61 and has climbed several 8A and 8A plus routes in the past couple of years, and 8B as recent as 2020, at 58 years old. And in 2015, at age 48, Ben climbed Steve McClure's Rain Shadow at 9A and is still burning kids off on his moonboard. But honestly, the last word didn't go to either of these guys. In 2018, UK Climbing made a documentary about the early Sheffield climbing scene called Statement of Youth. And in it, Ned Fihali, who's flashed V14, plays the part of Antoine Le Ministrel and recreates the solo of Revelations. Le Ministrel saw this and said, I called the director and told him, I'm not happy. Because the climber, he does not climb well. But it's a really strong climber, he said. Yes, but his feet were all over the place. Me, when I did it, there was not a single hesitation, and I climbed it a lot better than he did. You should have called me for that so that I could come redo the route. That same year, seemingly out of nowhere, came a French superstar who spent most of the 90s dominating the competition scene, Francois Legrand. He put bolts into a logical extension of Agincourt. In 2019, young French climber Loic Zahani would succeed on the line and suggest a grade of AC+, the first at Bukes, the cliff that birthed hard sport climbing and allowed the world to see what was possible. And the name of this line? Brexit Exit. Touché. One, two, three. written and 
Stone is produced by me, Chris Hampton, with help from Riley Rush and Emily Holland for Plug Tone Audio, a group of the best, most impactful podcasts in the outdoor industry. At the link in your show notes, you'll find all the things you expect, and probably some you don't, including links to Masters of Stone 3, where you can watch Jibé Tribu climbing Super Plafond and Bronx, a video that shows Ben Moon doing the first ascent of Agincourt, and a photo of both Tribu and Moon, alongside Yuji Hirayama, Boon Speed, and others in 90s era tights. And look, the show is 100% rooted in the facts, but like Todd Skinner always said, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. If you love what you're hearing, give us those five stars and a glowing review and tell everyone you know, at the crag, at the gym, follow the pod on your friends' phones and share it all over your social medias and together we can tell the stories of climbing's most important ascents, one decade at a time. What is up, stoners? You know what? I actually considered doing part of this episode as a rap battle between Ben Moon and Jibé Tribu. And then I realized, you know what? You're already doing too much. Slow down. You don't need to write raps for both of these guys. Honestly, I'm glad I didn't do that. But in this episode... I have hidden a reference to a very specific rap battle from the 1990s. Uh, I think it was 90s anyway. It must be 90s. And if you are the first person to go into the Patreon where I've posted about this rap battle and tell me who the artists were that were battling in my reference – then I've got something for you. Certainly a shout out on the show, but also depending on where you are in the world, I want to send you something. Um, So if you're a hip hop fan, tell me in there. Also, while you're in there, vote for which season is next. The 80s are ahead now. They were way behind last week. Uh, the, The 80s folks came through they voted, put it, put the 80s in the lead, 50% 80s, 46% 2000s. However, there's only 28 votes in there, and there are 52 of you now in the Patreon. So if you're in there and you haven't voted, go do it. Uh, this is a close race, and I'm interested to see who wins because I'm excited about both decades. Honestly, I'm glad the 70s are only at 4% because the 70s have been done to death and and done pretty damned well also. So the 80s and the 2000s, I think I could do them justice. So I don't really have a a dog in this fight, um, but I'm curious to know what you want. Also, big shout out to Dean, our newest legend patron. Um, And thank you for the really kind message. I'm doing my best here. I'm trying to keep people excited and keep people entertained with this show because it's so much fun for me. So, Dean, thank you. You know, I think I'll be making more episodes like this. Um, You know, not necessarily this length. I think I could do some short bonus episodes just for you all, just for the stoners. And I think they could be really fun if it's just me narrating, telling you a story um, about something interesting from the 90s. And there are lots of those. So be on the lookout for those coming relatively soon. We've also uh, got some big giveaways coming up. We just talked with Tension. Uh, We're having a cool product customized just for this written in stone giveaway. Uh, And I've also got some books to give away that I'll be doing right here in the Secret Stoners Club. So stay tuned for that. Um, Besides that, 
thank you guys again. I, I appreciate you being here. You're holding me accountable. Uh, I'm getting caught up right now, but I'm extra motivated to get it done because of you all. So thank you. Next week, probably the most important ascent of the 1990s. That's all I'm going to say. I'll see you then.